Hi, good evening. I would like to extend my heartful um, gratitude on behalf of the IFF team to Dr. Murlidhar for not only taking the time to joining us, but an incredibly insightful keynote address. What a powerful way to kick off Privacy Supreme 2024. I will also take the liberty to extend the same gratitude to all of you here this evening who've joined us on a Thursday um, as we shake things up a bit for this year's edition of our flagship annual event. What I mean by that is that unlike most Privacy Supremes and most other events, we have not one, not two, but zero panels for you this year. This year we present to you the UnPanel. Um, the UnPanel will be an unmoderated space where our speakers are free to speak on their areas of expertise and then we get to ask them questions. It's wonderful. The UnPanel will explore the future of privacy in India split across six themes. First, we have three speakers. Then we will have a round of question and answers and interactive audience session. Then we will take a short break, yay. Um, then we will have three more speakers and their own round of Q&As. If you've been following our social media promos, you already know this, but I will repeat the six themes that we have for this evening are artificial, artificial intelligence and harms, health privacy, social security in digital India, love archkal or love in the digital age, leisure loitering and urban surveillance, and lastly, dissent and privacy. I'm going to keep it short and not expand on these. I'll let the speakers do that. But for sure, we'll give a short introduction of the three speakers for the first round, which I will also request the speakers to take, take the stage with that. Um, so first, we will have um, Ambar Sena speaking on AI. Ambar is an information fellow with Tech Policy Press and the former executive director of the Center for Internet Society India. He works at the intersection of law, technology, and society, and studies the impact of digital technologies on socio-political processes and structures. Then we have Shafali Malhotra speaking on health privacy. Shafali is a research consultant with the Technology and Health Initiative at the Center for Health Equity, Law and Policy. Um, here, she primarily examines the governance and implementation of digital health technologies in India. Thirdly, we have Nikhil Day speaking on welfare and social security in digital India. Nikhil was one of the founding members of Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangathan. He has also been an integral part of significant campaigns that have given us the right to information, the right to work, and are now moving towards gig, work, gig work, worker welfare. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, so with that, I invite Ambar, then Shafali, then Nikhil, uh, post, we, post which we will open for a question and answers round. Uh, please take the stage and you can go in that order. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's both a privilege and uh, a huge challenge to, to follow Dr. Muridhar and also to start a discussion involving such an esteemed lineup of speakers. Uh, what I'll try to do is I'll try to speak to themes uh, which concern AI, but also themes that can help begin this conversation, which will be covered later through this unpanel. Now, the, the story of privacy and technology has always run parallelly. Technology evolves in ways that are intrusive, that are predictive, and increasingly now generative. And each time, privacy must reorient itself to respond to it. When we talk of the history of privacy, or the history of modern privacy, we often uh, begin at the landmark judgment in 1892. Uh, in Harvard uh, Law Review, written by Warren and Brandeis. The novel technology that Warren and Brandeis were dealing with was uh, Eastman Kodak print and shoot cameras. Uh, during mid-century, we saw case law which dealt with the technology of phone tapping. Uh, much of the battle for privacy in India in the last 15 years, uh, as you've already heard, dealt with... Uh, the technology of dig digital identification through the Aadhaar project. And the technological paradigm that I'm speaking about today is that of AI. Now, in each case, there are different aspects of life which technology intrudes into. Uh, Dr. Mulidhar spoke about nine different dimensions of privacy that Puttuswami one articulated. And the, the dimensions of privacy need to be defined to protect us from, from these intrusions. The seriousness of challenges that AI poses to privacy and data protection is very much in its multidimensionality, much like privacy itself is multidimensional. But what we need to remember 
in this discussion is that these challenges are not necessarily they are often amplifications of tensions that have already existed so let's take a step back to about 15 years ago uh, when ai as a term was not as much in use the term that was being used more regularly was big data uh, and big data and 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 then uh, very much followed by ai there were three fundamental ways in which these technologies uh, changed the threats to privacy the first was the sudden rise in storage capacity before that uh, storage of data was extremely expensive in order to collect and store more data you needed to purge data sets that already existed so this sort of natural limitation that uh, technology had offered uh, in its own kind of protection to privacy this inherently ch this changed inherently in the big data age the second key change was the birth of the smartphone which created a device capable of digitizing and datafying aspects of our life in ways that we had never seen before so what we see here is a dramatic move from the idea of manual data entry into databases to a continuous and automated collection of data about uh, very very intimate aspects of our lives the third key change and and that kind of segues directly into our discussion about ai was the rapid increase in computational capacity so when we speak about ai currently we are effectively speaking about machine learning and when we and in in a more limited sense we're talking about deep learning uh, and neural networks uh, the mat mathematical models that underpin ai that we use today are not new their foundations have existed for a few centuries uh, the way they must be used within an ai system the ideas around that have also been uh, there for about 60 to 70 years but the computational capacity required to make them operational didn't exist and that has only emerged in the last decade or so now let's also kind of contextualize all of this within the uh, with the background of where uh, as a digital polity the uh, our, our own country stands over the last two decades slowly but steadily governance uh, the governance agenda of the indian state has moved to the digital realm so starting with the negp plan uh, in 2006 to which effect, which to begin with was only intended to focus on digitalizing governance schemes that dealt with taxation that dealt with regulation of corporate entities issuance of passports pension portals etc to its uh, being subsumed under the nda government's flagship project digital india mission in 2014 uh, what we see is indian law and policy undergoing uh, a few different kinds of encounters with digital technologies the entire welfare program has moved to a digital platform built around a digital id that is becoming central or has very much become central to the recognition of a citizen and the uh, the adoption of newer technologies like dr muridhar mentioned largely through a series of administrative orders rather than legislative exercises which would undergo debate and dis uh, discussion in the parliament has fundamentally changed the nature of citizen state relationship and in many ways also posed different kinds of problems for analog era laws the i think the thing to sort of pay attention here is that governments keeping uh, or, or storing information about citizens is not new government databases about citizens have existed since national statistics have been around but uh, due to lack of technologies these databases could not speak to each other and the the way digital technology exists right now the the sort of centralized design with aadhaar at the middle of it as a unique identifier Uh, which exists across different kinds of databases and the logic of networks uh, created to make them interact seeks to create systems that enable interaction across databases now until say late 2022 
discussions about AI regulation focus largely on predictive AI systems that use data to classify, sort, and predict outcomes. Within the scope of predictive AI, concerns focused primarily on the outputs of these systems without as much focus on the data that was being used to train these systems. And so the policy discussions then would focus on algorithmic audits, on impact assessments, transparency, explainability, and the, the overall idea of enforcing civil rights as a means of ensuring decisional, that decisional outputs were fair and unbiased. But from late 2022 onwards, uh, with kind of chat GPT bursting on the scene in a very real way, generative AI has substantially uh, furthered that conversation. Generative systems are built predominantly on data, scraped from across the internet, and naturally concerns began to mount on exactly what data, and more importantly, whose data it was that was powering these systems. So now we find ourselves at a point where continued AI development will continue to increase the hunger for data, which is the foundation of AI systems. Secondly, the nature of privacy harms has also gradually changed in the last decade by the use of this sort of unrestrained data collection. And it extends beyond an individual level to the group and societal level. So these are not harms that are experienced only at, at an individual level, but individual choices about privacy or, or lack of choices about privacy has impact on groups that those individuals belong to. Third, uh, while existing and proposed privacy legislation based on the notice and consent model will implicitly continue to regulate AI development, it's amply clear that they are nowhere sufficient to address societal level privacy harms. And even legislations which contain explicit uh, provisions on algorithmic decision making and other forms of AI are uh, very much limited and don't provide data governance measures needed to meaningfully regulate the use of data. So how do we respond to these problems? These are complex systems. These are complex problems without straightforward and easy fix solutions. Uh, what we need to first recognize is that technology is not inevitable. Not every solution needs to involve an element of digital technology. And certainly uh, of the version of digital technology that is necessarily data hungry, that must not be seen as inevitable. And we need to dramatically flip the approach towards data protection so that the onus to protect privacy is not merely on users like you and me, but on powerful actors like the state and private companies. So we, we now find ourselves at a point that so Dr. Mulidhar spoke in detail about the, the sort of uh, the reading of privacy within uh, as a fundamental right uh, within across multiple provisions of part three of our constitution. But individual rights are now both necessary but also insufficient to protect data privacy in a world with AI. Uh, even in countries and states where there are robust data rights in place, the burden continues to be on individuals to exercise their rights after data collection, rather than uh, regulate for their preference to be respected at or before the initiation of data collection. So one example of the dramatic flip that I spoke about would be to shift away from opt-out to opt-in data collection. Uh, Lawrence Lessig spoke about the idea of code and architecture being law and the way that code, code and architecture in terms of data collection operates as law right now is to enable data maximization. If we have to completely change that, we need to operationalize the principle of data minimization, not just in law, but within the design of tech systems. Uh, and so one example would be to make so, for instance, there is a lot of conversation when it relates to children's privacy to have uh, defaults which don't allow for excess collection of data. One sort of way we could look at that is to extend that protection to adults as well. Uh, we've seen some limited examples in, uh, you know, within sort of technologies that all of us use, 
So Apple's rollout of app tracking transparency and, and the specific rollout that we see from iOS 14.5, uh, where users were asked when they first open the an app whether they wish to allow it to track activity across apps and websites. Uh, then uh, more recently, California has opened a door to an approach uh, which is which is more popularly known as Global Privacy Control or GPC, which can function as an automatic opt out uh, as a browser plugin uh, for CCPAs do not sell my personal information provision. So what we must remember is that Puttuswami held that privacy is both a negative and a positive right, meaning that not only does it restrain the state from committing an intrusion into the life and personal liberty of a citizen, it also imposes a positive obligation on the state to take all necessary measures to protect the privacy of the individual from private actors as well as uh, state actors, particularly when the state takes on a larger role uh, with its welfare agenda. So it is clear that data protection law in that sense emerges very clearly from that positive duty. Uh, unfortunately, if we were to review the direction of India's digital policy making in the last decade and uh, sort of more recently in the last few years, it is highly unlikely that these regulatory measures will be undertaken. The Indian state has been on a journey to promote and enable data maximalism, seeing more and more generation of data about its 1.4 billion people as central to a misguided and poorly formulated national strategy. The recently enacted personal data protection law was something that came at the end of a decade of slow and dithering approach to policy making, even after the government committed to the Supreme Court in 2017 during hearings in the Puttaswami 1 case, it took six more years to even enact a law and we still don't have a regulator or rules in place. So on, on that uh, depressing note, uh, I'll wrap up. Thank you.